but not on foreign policy. Except in your uh, articles here and there. Uh, to begin with, I would uh, like to very respectfully to pay you my very warm compliments on this book, which I think is a great read. Uh, apart from uh, uh, the views you express about foreign policy making, the context, the framework in which foreign policy should be made. I have read all 11 chapters of it, every word that you have written, because I, I, I was in this profession, I read everything that you've written about foreign policy, and I think this is perhaps about the best book in recent years on foreign policy. So my compliments once again. Thank you very much. Uh, it's a very comprehensive book, somewhat futuristic. And uh, what I liked about it in particular is summed up in four or five lines at the framework in which you give us your thinking on uh, uh, India's foreign policy in bits and pieces here and there about the past, but in a more sustained manner about the future. I'm going to read this uh, short paragraph. We are blessed with a new, globalized, impatient generation of Indians who rightly refuse to be confined to the limited world views of older generations. The horizons of their world are ever widening. The prospects for international engagement, for more widespread prosperity, for more borderless success have never been brighter. But to fulfill those prospects and to help them carve, carve out a place for their India in the 21st century world, India needs a radical overhaul of the domestic underpinnings of its international posture. The time to begin that overhaul is now. This is a vision. Combined with this is uh, a certain awareness of the past, uh, recent past, after independence, where you say that Nehru's old globalist orientation is still hardwired into the consciousness of policymakers. <coughs> Past, present, future mingles in vision. Now, uh, this is not to say that I'm going to agree with you everything that you said. I think there are minor things in which some minor, some major things uh, uh, in which I think the next edition of the book probably could improvise a little bit here. What do you think? Am I right in saying that this is the kind of vision that you have when you are writing this book? Thank you very much, first of all, for those kind words, uh, Ambassador Skutra, a man whom I've um, called on more than two decades ago, I think, when you were High Commissioner to the UK. I've had the privilege of knowing you more closely since then, and it's a, it's a genuine, uh, it's a matter of pride to hear such kind words from you. Yes, that is my vision. They very much. Um, a vision of uh, attempting to rethink our place in the world in this increasingly globalized 21st century of ours with a young population that is much more connected to the rest of the world and that needs to be more connected in its own interest. I, at the same time, do stress that I am not approaching foreign policy purely as an internationalist or as a former UN official, let alone as a former minister of state for external affairs, but very much as somebody whose daily preoccupations as member of parliament for Tirumanantapuram, which despite being the capital of Kerala is still largely a rural constituency, uh, is uh, essentially the, the, what's on the minds of ordinary voters uh, in, in, in my constituency, for whom of course foreign policy is less and less remote than it used to be. Because the world now has a way of impacting upon the daily lives of Indians. Um, in a manner of which we're only dimly becoming aware. But in fact, increasingly, people are no longer able to think of foreign policy as purely foreign, because it affects them right here in India, where they live. And things that happen half a world away can have an impact on your livelihood, and what you eat, and what you pay for your diesel or your kerosene, 
on, on where you can go, or, uh, which foreign countries trawlers might might shoot at you or invade your fishing grounds, and I'm thinking, thinking of the fishwoman in my constituency, and so on. So I, I have a I have a very strongly anchored view of foreign policy as an instrument to promote the security and well-being of the Indian people. In other words, foreign policy as a tool in our domestic transformation. And my orientation is very much in that regard. It, it's not foreign policy as an end in itself. It's not abstract principles of global alignment or non-alignment or, or whatever. It is much more, if you like, a, a, a realist, pragmatic approach to playing a role on the world stage that will in fact help advance our own domestic goals, as well as, of course, fulfill that internationalist DNA that Nehru wired into our consciousness from the very beginning. That is a, a little different, I think, that I hear. Your definition of foreign policy, is it on? Yes. You say the basic task for countries like China, and India, and international affairs is to wield a foreign policy that enables and facilitates their own domestic transformation. Then you want transformation in uh, uh, certain areas, domestic transformation. By this, as an Indian, I mean that my country's engagement with the world must make possible the transformation of India's economy and society. Economy, yes, but society, how? <laughs> well, uh, just a second. Mm -hmm. While prom promoting our own national values of pluralism, democracy, social justice, and secularism, how does the outside hope. world come into all this? Economy, yes. Other things, security, certainly. And there are other dimensions. Uh, what exactly do you mean by this, sir? Uh, right. I, I, I'm, I'm glad to, to, to walk into this right on at the beginning of the conversation with you. Um, of course, when I say society, I mean that we want to preserve the kind of society that our founding fathers have laid out as the ideal for us. In other words, a society that is pluralist, a society where people of different faiths and different ideologies can contend and flourish. If you, if you allow American influences, we'll all be hamburger-eating people, you <laughs> see? A totally different society. As long as you're free to be a, a sort of Muslim hamburger-eater or a Hindu hamburger-eater <laughs> or, a, you know, an OBC hamburger eater or, or, or a Brahmin. It, in other words, my point is that we don't want to find ourselves in a position where our international choices restrict our ability to be ourselves at home. Um, so, for example, we would have a fairly skeptical view uh, of signing on to, shall we say, a, a war on terror that could be interpreted in countries of a certain faith as being a war on a particular faith because preserving a sense of security for that faith on our own soil is important to us domestically. I mean, to some degree, I'm, I'm speaking in code when I say some of these things, but that these values in our society will always have an influence on our choices internationally as well. See, Dr. Tharoor, my experience of foreign policy is that it's essentially uh, primarily about security. Mm -hmm. I know you deal with the security aspect. Much less than I do with other. Much other. less than I thought you should have done. Probably a separate chapter uh, on security, what India needs to do about it. I think uh, uh, we are not all well up in our security dimensions. Now, Nehru had a very simple uh, definition of foreign policy. Just one short sentence. I, I heard him in Parliament, and it is in the record of one of his early speeches. Uh, somebody asked him, how do you define foreign policy? Is, what is foreign policy? It is being nice to everybody, being friends with everybody, he changed the word, and pursuing your own national interest. Now, you, you give us a definition of national interest later on. Uh, I think it's in the first chapter. It's repeated in the another the chapter, chapter also. But again, I didn't find security there. Now, I'll tell you why. I mean, I, try, I did actually give some thought to whether I should have a separate chapter on security, and I thought that would actually do um, injustice to something as important as the issue of national security, which frankly would deserve a separate book. Instead, I weaved into each country chapter some consciousness of security imperatives. The Pakistan chapter and the China chapter, you'll see that very clearly. But my argument about domestic transformation would mean, for example, that I argue we need 
to preserve good relations with countries that are sources of investment into India. We need good relations with countries that are sources of our energy security. We're not going to grow. If you, if you think of growth and economic development as our lodestar, uh, very clearly we're not going to grow without adequate energy. We're not going to get that energy entirely domestically. We're getting barely 25%. So we need good relations with countries that can supply it. And so foreign policy becomes an instrument to open up not just the existing and preserve and protect the existing sources of supply from the Middle East, but open up new sources in places like Africa, which we might not have thought of 10 or 15 years ago, but which we need to do for a very specifically divine domestic purpose. In, in the years to come, we will need to also think of foreign policy for our food secure, security, True. because we're not able to meet the demands of our increasingly uh, growing <coughs> consumer population. <coughs> and in these circumstances, we will suddenly find ourselves, for example, seriously trying to acquire significant tracts of land in Africa or Latin America with a view to growing products for our own consumption in India. And that too will become an aspect of our foreign policy. So those were the kinds of things I was thinking of for tomorrow. I weave in major security imperatives into the country chapters, but I felt I wasn't going to write an entire book on security, and I felt that those aspects of foreign policy that relate to our keep, us keeping ourselves safe tend to be the ones that are most understood and most discussed in the op-ed pages of our newspapers and so on, whereas this kind of vision is much less treated, and that's why I wanted to focus more on this. You see, why I am emphasizing this point, concepts of security are in a dynamic transition because of the scientific and technological developments are taking place very largely in the United States of America, some in Europe, uh, some in China perhaps. Now we are moving on because of these uh, sci scientific and technological changes from genetics to plant engineering, from uh, nanotechnology to advances in nuclear magnetic resonance uh, spectroscopy to guard particle. We have reached there now. And we have this, uh, what a curiosity, exploring the Mars. This is going to uh, introduce very, very vital dimensions in military security of countries. Mm -hmm. Of course, there are other aspects also. I know you have written about cyber security. I incidentally, uh, those of you who haven't read it, I recommend the article of the 23rd of Hindu on cyber security. Uh, that's another aspect. You see, this environmental security, energy security, <coughs> food security uh, are important, very important. But if a nation is not militarily secure, everything else falls by the background. This I agree. I mean, obviously, if you don't have a worthwhile defense, you cannot protect your development. But if you don't have a worthwhile development, you won't have a country worth defending. So in other words, you do need to have both. And I think that ultimately that's... Um, that's something that I, I bear very much in mind in the, in the book. Mr. Panda, what do you say about this? Uh, you are in politics. Uh, I'm sure in Parliament, outside, you give thought to these matters. First of all, I'd like to clarify that I'm not here to match wits with Shashi, <laughs> which, is a, which is a dangerous proposition, considering his great eloquence. I believe that this book is not only one of the most important on foreign policy that's been written in recent years. I believe that it's long overdue. My own guess is that it's overdue by perhaps as much as a decade, but certainly at least a few years. Because what has happened in the last decade and perhaps a decade and a half is that India has changed. The perception that the world has about India has changed dramatically. Now while we are changing ourselves, I don't think we have adequately coped with our increased heft in the world. Uh, there's been a lot of talk about whether India is ready to be at the high table of global foreign policy, policy making. And I think Shashi comes and makes the point, and he's uniquely qualified for this because of his background in international diplomacy and now for some years in Indian politics. He's uniquely qualified to make this argument that this is what we need to do to transition from how we have been functioning to where we ought to be and where the world already sees us. 
as functioning. So I want to say that there's almost, you know, there's much of it that I agree with him. And so there's, there's really not, um, there's no requirement for me to sort of cross swords with him as it were. I do have a couple of uh, sort of differences of opinion and I'm going to ask him about it. But I wanted to make a point here that I share his view of how we must build Pakistan's and South Asian countries stake in a stable India. Increased trade, liberal visa regimes, so on and so forth. I agree with him that the threat of uh, military conflict with China is overblown. And I'm glad that at the same time he addresses the need for us to, to build up our defense capabilities, which addresses the point that you were just making about security. I agree with him that our old concept of strategic autonomy cannot now just be an end in itself. I think this very much parallels our economic philosophy, and that has changed over the last two decades. We used to believe in economic self-sufficiency, and now we are significantly more globalized in an interconnected world, and in most ways, we are better off for that. Uh, I, I completely agree about the beefing up of the IFS that is necessary. Uh, I mean, he's the expert in this, but I remember just recently reading that just one mission, the U.S.'s mission in Delhi probably has a bigger strength than our entire uh, foreign, foreign service. God forbid we shouldn't copy the Americans. I'm just talking about, <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not saying we should, but I do wish to point out that there are a couple of areas where I have questions and I'd like to address them to Shashi. Yes, please. I think in his excellent and great uh, sort of explanation of our Nehruvian foreign policy origins, particularly non-alignment, I think he's been too uncritical. Too? Uh, uncritical. Mm. And, you know, it's perhaps because he has political compulsions or perhaps not. <laughs> but to say that because we were non-aligned all those years, we could transition into a modern era and have equally friendly relations with everybody in the new world order, I think is, is just too simplistic. I would, I would wish him to point out the strengths and the shortcomings of uh, non-alignment, uh, but I do agree with his, his conclusion that we now are in an era of multi-alignment. One more question, one more area where I don't disagree, but I'm a little, I'm seeking clarity. I agree with him that we need to take forward our relationship, our new developing relationship with the United States. And also that we should take this to Latin America. But he hasn't addressed the issue of how we deal with the contradiction where you have new socialist alliances in Latin America that are opposed to the US. How, do we, how does uh, um, multi-alignment work in places like that? That's what I'd pose to him. I think uh, I should like to come back on uh, for a moment on non-alignment. Mm -hmm. I think you are a little, uh, there is some ambivalence uh, in your portrayal of what you think of non-alignment. I think non-alignment is passe. You see, it's wrong for anyone to think of non-alignment as an eternal principle which should determine our foreign policy. This was a policy. Uh, uh, prepared in certain uh, world circumstances, which met our interests at the time, I think this policy became irrelevant uh, actually by the end of the 60s, or if you want to stretch the point, mid-70s. And you will see, in actual practice, what did we do? When we needed to align with somebody in 1962, we sued for uh, alliance with the United States of America, asking their Air Force to come and defend our skies. In 1971, we needed uh, support from some outside power, and we allied ourselves, we signed a treaty, uh, which is more definitive of an alliance than the NATO treaty. The only saving grace was when the Americans pointed this to, I was at this meeting uh, when Sardar Swaran Singh had with uh, uh, Bill, what was his name, the Secretary of State. Rogers. William Bill Rogers. Rogers. Rogers said, where is your non-alignment? Here you are, you signed a treaty. 
you are aligned now with Soviet Russia. I, I marveled at the audacity and our Sardar Saab said to him, Mr. Rogers, I have my Prime Minister's authority to offer the same treaty to you here and now. And Bill Rogers didn't know where to look. But where was our non-alignment? You can say this was non-alignment. The world has changed. India's needs have changed. We require science, technology. We've fallen way behind science and technology of China. 20 years behind. We were ahead of them uh, 25, 30 years ago. Where are these needs to be fulfilled from? China? United States? Maybe at the second tier, Europe. So we should uh, define our alignments in the context of our needs of security, progress, prosperity, scientific, technological advancement. You, I, I would have wanted you to be a little more clear about it. Well, I agree entirely with what you just said, uh, almost word, word to word. Um, to Jay, I should say that I have a, a bit of a paper trail on this because my very first book, Reasons of State, was widely seen as a, as a, as a somewhat ill-tempered attack on our foreign policy to date. So I thought that the time had come for some corrective balance 30 years later. That was 1981 that that was published and perhaps had some of the youthful exuberance for which uh, uh, freshly minted PhDs are, are rightly derided. And also the lack of a crystal ball about which party you think. Exactly, 30 years <laughs> later. Thank you. Thank you, Jay. Yes, I'll, I'll remember that. <laughs> but I also do feel that it's not so much that non-alignment um, needs to be critiqued. One can explain and, 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 and uh, justify its logic at the time, but rather that we have reached a point where the whole binary Cold War world within which non-alignment was devised has simply ceased to exist and therefore the, the notion of choosing not to be aligned between two superpowers simply no longer exists and we have sort of dumbed down the definition of non-alignment to mean not being aligned with anybody which uh, at bottom line I suppose the US can say they're not aligned too because they're not aligned to anybody but themselves I mean it becomes at this point a term that really doesn't have a whole lot of meaning anymore in the post-Cold War world it has, of course, been seen very much as being tied up, and certainly Nehru can be partly credited or blamed for this, being tied up with our assertion of our own independence and our own national self-respect. The whole notion, I, I recount this apocryphal story, and I say it, I'm sure it didn't actually happen, but it's a great anecdote. It's in your uh, book. In, uh, in my <laughs> book about John Foster Dulles, Eisenhower's Secretary of State, who had notoriously said, uh, or famously said, depending on your point of view, that non-alignment between good and evil is itself evil. Uh, allegedly saying to Nehru in a phrase that has become much more famous in a, in a later American president's m uh, words, uh, are you with us or against us? And Nehru replies, yes. <laughs> 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 we're with you when we agree with you, in other words. We, we're not with you when we don't agree with you. And the freedom to think that way was fundamental uh, to India's assertion of its own self-respect in world affairs for 200 years. Somebody else had decided for us what our posture should be on any international issue. And now, uh, as Nehru saw it, it was extremely important that we decide for ourselves. And in deciding for ourselves, we wanted to be free to choose our, our, our stances as it suited us. And from this emerged the whole notion of strategic autonomy, which, is, which makes a lot of sense, that you preserve your autonomy to take positions on, on, on world affairs as suits your interests. The problem has been that perhaps thanks to non-alignment, strategic autonomy had become to some degree a limiting straitjacket rather than a springboard from which to leap. And I'm arguing, as Jay has already alluded to it, I'm arguing that we have now moved beyond simple notions of non-alignment to what I call multi-alignment, that is, uh, a world in which you have relationships with countries in different permutations and combinations for different purposes so that you can belong to both the United Nations where has 193 countries belong, and to SARC, where you're focused on your immediate neighborhood. You can belong to both the Global Trade Union of Developing Countries, the G77, which reflects our anti-colonial history and heritage, and also to the um, uh, community of democracies in which many of the colonies we've been attacking are the star members as, as the major Western democracies. That you can belong to both... Uh, um, uh, I'm sorry, that, 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 was, that was hastily phrased. 
the G77, I was going to juxtapose to the G20, the global trade union and the global management. Uh, and, and, and I was going to mention, as I, as I should have done, the non-aligned movement and the community of democracies as the two opposites. But these are all different kinds of combinations in which we belong. And then if you look at our annual meetings with the Russians and Chinese at foreign minister level, that's called RIC. And we add the Brazilians and South Africans and we have BRICS. Then we take away the Russians and Chinese and we have IBSA for South-South cooperation. Or we add the Chinese and don't add the Russians and we have BASIC for environmental negotiations. And we're the only country that belongs to all of those groups, uh, not only because our country's name begins with that indispensable element in every acronym, a vowel, uh, but also because, of course, we have uh, the ability uh, to actually be relevant in all these different contexts. And that is where the whole notion of Pax Indica come from. I'm not alluding, as I make it very clear, to a Pax Romana or Pax Britannica kind of world domination. I'm talking about India being a linchpin of a global peace system in which countries cooperate across these boundaries in this globalized world of ours to achieve certain, certain national interests for themselves in such ways that they don't actually impinge upon our other relationships and other patterns of relationships elsewhere. And strategic autonomy then is all very well. We keep that freedom. But at the same time, we should not see it as a country that others are acting upon as a sort of rule taker in international affairs, which we were initially. We are now at a place where we can think of ourselves as a rule maker as well as contributing we have, to the... We have always the, exercised strategic autonomy exactly. from day one of our independence. This should be taken for granted. I don't know why our thinkers, uh, the strategic community so-called, uh, place so much emphasis on the necessity of acquiring, gaining, retaining uh, strategic autonomy. Who's going to take it away from us? You're quite right, and I say exactly those words that we can take it for granted in the, in the book. Now, Mr. Panda, you... I actually want to push Shashi a bit further on the multi-alignment bit. You know, you explained to us, I think, very eloquently about how we can be uh, participants of all these various diverse organizations. Let me interrupt the, you. I, I have an allergy to this alignment word. Why can't we call it something That's different? what he uses. His, his term I is... all my fault. I know. Uh, I, I'm going to suggest to him an alternative. Please. No, All-round engagement. My, my question was... A little less was, catchy than multi-alignment, <laughs> but I take it as, 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 as an example. My question to Shashi is that in trying to be members, in being actually members of all these various different organizations, some of them with conflicting interests, don't we stand the risk of behaving as if we have multiple personality disorder? And how do, how do we actually reconcile where there are real differences on the ground? So if you tell me how we would deal with Latin America and how we deal with our new increased friendship with the U.S., particularly when you have these groups of countries in Latin America that are very opposed to U.S. foreign policy, that will help us to sort of appreciate as an example of how, uh, whatever we call it, multi-alignment or uh, all-encompassing um, engagement uh, actually works on the ground. Look, I, I believe that part of the art of skill diplomacy is dealing with contradictions anyway and dealing with it all the time. You'd mentioned Latin America and I didn't respond to your first uh, reference to it. But the fact is, for example, we're already dealing with the fact that our principal partner in Latin America uh, in recent years has been Brazil, which, as you know, is a Portuguese-speaking country, unlike the rest of the continent, which is mainly Spanish-speaking. Uh, and at the same time, we have managed to dance in a tightrope and, and preserve and protect and promote relations with traditional friends like Mexico and new friends like Colombia and Argentina uh, in ways that, very frankly, um, uh, might in some, at some level have been seen as incompatible with our new Brazil emphasis, had we not done this more adroitly. Uh, similarly, uh, yes, uh, we have in fact purchased oil from uh, President Chavez's Venezuela. And uh, I mean, the Americans don't want to see him getting reelected, and he doesn't particularly want to see their influence in his part of the world. But we have so far managed uh, to make it clear to both sides of this dispute that we are on neither in that particular issue. In other words, we can tell the Americans credibly that we agree with them on A, B, C, and D, disagree with them on E and F, and are essentially indifferent or, or consider our views irrelevant on H, I, and J, and, and so on down the alphabet. And, and I believe that both the Americans and ourselves are wise enough and mature enough to take that for what, it, what it's worth, try and expand, if you like, the category of agreement to more letters of the alphabet and reduce the ones of disagreement, but to accept that we are not 
and we have not pretended to be a sort of permanent ally on all issues. Similarly, we can tell President, uh, President, Venezuela, uh, President of Venezuela that we are, we are not interested uh, in uh, a third country's attitude to him and his government, that we have our own position, which remains anchored and uh, refusing to interfere in his domestic uh, situation, that we accept him for who he is, and if tomorrow somebody else is in his job, we'll accept that person too. And I'm afraid that uh, he, he's going to have to accept that, provided he doesn't feel us in any way contributing to undermining his position, which we are not, he'll continue to be willing to sell oil to us. And so it goes. It seems to me that our willingness to play that role has become actually pretty starkly apparent in the Arab Spring. Because you've seen in Libya and now in Syria, India walking a very delicate type. From in Syria and the Security Council, we voted twice with, with the Americans and against the Russians and Chinese on the Syrian issue even though much of what we'd said in the past would have seemed to be more sympathetic to the Russian and Chinese position, because we voted what we've judged to be our best interests, not only vis-a-vis -vis Syria, but also vis-a-vis -vis our credibility on the Security Council in the eyes of certain other powers. And that may be the kind of calculation we're going to have to make day after day after day on a number of issues. But let's, let's talk about skilled diplomacy. That's what we need to have. The example that you just cited uh, voting one way and then voting differently on you know, related issues, doesn't that actually reduce our influence compared to, for instance, what on Syria, for instance, what Russia and China have demonstrated by weighing in heavily more on one side than on another? Well, I think we've made the calculation that, uh, that we cannot afford to put all our eggs in one particular basket, even though we've made no secret of the fact that we have been rather happy with the idea of a secular regime in the Middle East, which the Assad regime is, and that we are extremely worried and wary of a, an alternative that might involve uh, elements uh, that are far more Islamist in political orientation and therefore likely to be more hostile to us on issues that matter to us on which Damascus was actually sympathetic. So, so you know, we are not in any means uh, ready to go gung-ho in favor of all elements of the somewhat motley opposition Assad is facing. At the same time, uh, we are persuaded by those arguments that say that any government that treats its own people with the kind of cruelty and, and violence that we have seen engendered by the, by the regime cannot and does not deserve our political support. I think, uh, we won't, on the other hand, go far enough uh, with the Chinese and Russians and back the Assad regime uncritically, we've said we need a transition, but a negotiated transition. No, it no, is a way of dancing on a tightrope, but I think we've actually danced reasonably no, well. I, I have no quarrel with our votes on Syria. But I think the far more important, uh, from our point of view, is the question of security of the Gulf region. Mm -hmm. We have six million people working there, huge trade, remittances, so on and so forth. And uh, there are great uncertainties in the region. I do not see any sign of uh, this issue receiving uh, the attention of the government to the extent it should. What in a crisis will India do? Syria is still far away. I think we should uh, get together with, uh, let's say, Egypt, for example, Egypt will have a great role, not Turkey. Turkey is trying very hard, but there are deep suspicions about Turkey in the Arab world. The country will be matter finally, which will uh, uh, give uh, uh, direction uh, to the so-called Arab Spring and so on and so forth, is Egypt. I don't think we are doing much with that country. Itself. Well, because Egypt itself has been through a certain amount of turbulence. That is not wholly surprising. And for example, their principal Securities are under Mubarak, with whom we definitely had links in the past. Uh, uh, as you know, he's recently passed away, but he was, he was ousted with the Arab Spring. We suddenly must have been floundering in terms of who would be the right interlocutor. We dealt with the military under General Tantawi. Now he's out uh, in, in some sort of honorific position while other people have come in uh, of, a, of a different orientation. So I suspect that like others, I don't think we're the only ones floundering a bit in terms of actually getting a handle. On who's thought, doing I, the security? I, I thought we fact. understand the Arabs better than others who are floundering. <laughs> so, <laughs> we, we, so, we should do. And look, I, I'm, see, I'm not in government, so I can't claim to have any inside knowledge of Saudi how, well, Arabia, how badly we're doing. With Saudi, but Saudi Arabia, Arabia, we are talking. Yeah, we are talking. talking. Very important. We are very focusing important. too much on Iran. How many Indians are settled in Iran? Not very many. Not well, 
I mean, we have our traditional relationship. Iran has a certain importance, especially from the point of view of giving India transit to Central Asia. Mm -hmm. But these are things uh, in the far future. There are immediate issues in the Arab world right. today on which we should pay more attention. But I want to bring you back. Uh, but but let me say, I, do, I do agree on, on Gulf security. One last sentence. I've actually said in the book that I feel we haven't done enough yeah. to promote sustained and serious strategic dialogue on security right. issues with the Gulf country. I happen to know that because I know some of the Gulf country leaders reasonably well. And I would say we need to do more. But we are talking to the Saudis. We're talking to some degree with the UAE, but not enough in my view. Some degree with the Omanis. But I think we, we really ought to work together with some of these countries where we have large numbers of Indians. But apart from the direct interest in terms of the well-being of the Indian people, anything seriously going wrong in those countries yeah could affect our energy security and our, uh, and, our, and, our, and our geopolitical backyard. So we can't afford not to have better links. Right. Agreed. Foreign policy begins with neighbors. Mm -hmm. It shouldn't end there, and our foreign policy hasn't ended there. I read your chapters on the neighborhood very, very carefully, actually twice over, especially the brother enemy. The brother enemy. You are very soft on the brother enemy. <laughs> you are depending on the international community to persuade Pakistan uh, to, to bring to justice the criminals who caused havoc in Mumbai. This is not going to happen. Their government is involved in this. How are they going to do all that, what you demand, uh, the international community? They have been trying. No effect. I think there's too much of Malone in, <laughs> in, in your book on neighbors. Malone was not infallible. Uh, I don't think he knew very much about what India's foreign policy was in the past. He says uh, now the foreign policy of India towards neighbors is becoming pragmatic. Nehru's policy was flawed. Indira Gandhi's policy was flawed. Utter nonsense. Nehru brought up Bhutan to the level where, and Sri Lanka for that matter, and Nepal, where he felt able to persuade Stalin not to block the vote which we had proposed in the United Nations for their entry as members. Malone didn't know that. And uh, I have worked on Nepal, for example, for nearly 12 years of my career in the Foreign Service. What is it that we haven't done for Nepal? But you'll never make Nepal happy. Take it from me. The water resources on which we have, a, um, I have had an eye for 50 years, 60 years, it's not going to materialize. Because uh, Nepal at one stage was caught, when I was foreign secretary, telling the Bangladeshis not to do anything about it. You know, this is a lever of pressure we have on India. With this kind of mentality, where do you go? Mm. On the other hand, with Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Bhutan, uh, Maldives, our neighbors, our relations are very good relations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, Pakistan is an exception. I mean, Pakistan, I once asked Panditji in 1960, I said, sir, what about Kashmir? What will happen to Pakistan? He looked at me, I was a youngster at the time. He said, you know, there are, there are problems to which there are no solutions. After a moment's silence, he added, only time. So in due time, I think, I think that time may have begun. Pakistani seem to be realizing that this chapter of antagonism, hostility to India must end. Uh, it's a good chapter you have written. I have no problem with your chapters on um, uh, uh, South America. I think we have to... Uh, go out of our way to cultivate those countries. And uh, 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 Africa, I think our policy, by and large, is right. Chinese are doing much more there. But I have a feeling that we are doing better. We are trying to edu give them facilities of education, agriculture, uh, helping them develop their resources for their own use there. Uh, help them set up industries and things of that kind. Chinese want their timber, they want their copper, they want their everything that they have by way of resources. So uh, uh, I'm, I'm happy with these chapters, but I think your emphasis on Pakistan. Well, I'll tell you, on Pakistan, I actually make the realest case for peace. Sorry, Jay, do you want to May I just put in a very quick question, which you could, it's related, and maybe you could answer that jointly. I've been confronting you with areas that I don't agree with you. Let me confront you with something I do agree with you. 
You talk about yeah. our South Asian neighbors and say that it's in our interest to aim for greater economic cooperation. Mm -hmm. And you've argued that we should give more than we take. And I think it'll be, I, I, I'm on board with you there, but I think it'll be useful for us to have you talk a little bit about that. Okay. Well, let me first answer on Pakistan since I've been accused of being no, soft. let me also say <laughs> something about the Gujral doctrine. All right. You know what the doctrine was, actually. You give it a more elegant language <laughs> than it originally carried. I think it was originally conceived in Punjabi, wasn't it? No, well, no, no, it was Bengali. <laughs> there was a Bengali scholar working with the uh, with, uh, emotional. We should give our neighbors everything that they want from us. What nonsense? I don't say reciprocity necessarily, but Nehru's policy was they are as bad or worse than we are. He was thinking of Nepal at the time. If they want something from us, we have the capability to part with what we have, a bit of it, and give it to them. We should do that. We should help them when they ask for our help. I think that was the right policy. This is the policy which Indra Gandhi followed, Lal Bahadur Shastri followed, Moraji Desai followed. But being mushy, sentimental about neighbors, you know, neighborhood, because, you know, we are a very large country. Look at China's neighbors, the kind of relationship China has with Vietnam, with South Korea, with Japan, with India, for that matter, and others. We are much better off this group. Why is there such sense of guilt? Uh, which uh, percolates in your writing also. <laughs> on the neighbors, all right. All right, well, I'll, I'll address both then. Certainly first on Pakistan. I, I, I must say that uh, uh, not everybody would agree with Ambassador Gotha's critique that, that I've been soft, because actually there are many, many sections of the chapter on Pakistan where I have been, in the views of our well-meaning friends, excessively harsh. Uh, and that's because I am neither a hawk in the sense that I don't believe there is a military option available to us to resolve this problem permanently, nor am I a sort of candlelighted waga kind of dove, of whom there are many in Delhi, uh, because I'm a dove who's been mugged by reality, by, by the experience of the fact of, of, of the last um, 25, 30 years of our relationship, where Vajpayee goes off on his bus yatra and is rewarded with Kargil a few months later, uh, or that Manmohan Singh conducts these talks back channel and front channel with Musharraf and Zadari, and 2611 follows in Mumbai. In other words, there have been too many instances of endeavors being made by India to promote peace, which have been met by not just active hostility, but by direct attack on Indian territory or on Indian soil, uh, on Indian interests, which clearly will affect any subsequent Indian attitudes and policy thereafter. And I argue that the issue is not Kashmir or any other dispute. There are some disputes that are more easily resolvable than others. But the real problem, in my view, is the nature of the Pakistani state itself, which uh, is a very unusual thing. I mean, as I've said, paraphrasing Voltaire on Prussia, whereas in India the state has an army, in Pakistan the army has a state. And the army essentially controls all the levers of the state, has directly ruled it for a majority of the years of its existence, and when it hasn't, it has controlled how far a civilian government can go on, on any area, with the result, in fact, that no civilian government has so far managed to last its entire elective term of office uh, in the entire history of Pakistan. So you've got a, you've got a genuine problem uh, in, in Pakistan because the army, and uh, since you joined the army not to defend the country but to run the country, you need to be able to justify the dispropor disproportionate share of resources you have. No army in the world has a larger share of its country's budget or GDP than the Pakistani army. No army in the world. And so if you want to be able to preserve that, you need not war, because no general particularly wants to die. You need hostility. You need the illusion of a threat. You need a problem across the border to be able to justify that influence. And so I'm quite unsparing in my critique of Pakistan. Nonetheless, I do make a realist argument for peace, and which is that it's in our interest to have peace in Pakistan, because if, as you go back to my original proposition of foreign policy promoting our domestic development and interests, if you want to grow and develop, you can't afford to be hobbled by indefinite hostility with people across the border. But that becomes an albatross around your neck. So it's in your interest, in India's interest, to have peace because we need the freedom to be able to develop according to our own lights. Investors are not going to come and invest in a war zone. Uh, traders don't want to have their trade agreements and arrangements interrupted. And so they would like to see peace on the subcontinent in order to engage with us. And we need them because our priority 
which is not the priority of the Pakistani military, is to ensure the growth and prosperity and development of our own people. And in that spirit, I argue for peace. So it's very much a realist argument and not a, a woolly-headed, sort of idealistic argument uh, for peace in Pakistan. Pardon, on the neighbors, just to finish on, on the yeah. second point, Jay's and, and your subsequent point, on the neighbors, I would agree with you that there is no cause for excessive guilt, but I would disagree that our conduct has been no exempt. Guilt. Why excessive guilt? <laughs> there should be no because there is a perception, and you talk to Bangladeshis and Nepalis and so on at different stages, you do get from their side a perception that we have been somewhat bullying, to put it bluntly, <laughs> Lord. Uh, in, in, some certain, in some situations. And I do say in the book, look, some of it we can't help. We are 70% uh, of the population of the South Asian subcontinent and 80% of the GDP. So inevitably we displace more weight around the table when we sit at it uh, than, the, than the others do. And some of the flack we'll get, as any big country gets from its smaller neighbors. I mean, I, I think the Mexican attitude to America isn't particularly warmer uh, or happier or more friendly than any of our neighbors to us. But the fact is that, this is where Jay's point comes in, I do argue for an asymmetrical approach on the grounds that we can afford to give more. I see no particular reason to be mealy-mouthed. I mean, you know, yes, when Gujral gave the, the most favored nation status to Pakistan back in 1995, uh, and then waited 17 years for reciprocation, so it became the only example in the entire history of world trade of a one-sided MFN arrangement, where one country extended MFN status and the, others, other, the other did not reply uh, with it. But finally, we seem to be coming up with this, and I, and I do argue, that if right now there is a 2611, uh, nobody in Pakistan loses out from the immediate consequences and the fallout of that. But if you actually have trade, if large sections of the Pakistani establishment and the Pakistani capitalist class are making money hand over fist in India, then they will become a constituency for peace because the next misadventure from Pakistan, which interrupts trade, will actually hurt them in their pockets and they will become a voice within Pakistan for better relations with India. So there is an argument, I make a similar argument with China for that matter, that we can actually think of trade as strengthening the possibility of avoiding conflict with China because, again, if you actually have uh, large, a large sort of profit margin coming to China and large amount of goods coming from India to China and large market in India for Chinese goods, they will not want to jeopardize that in the name of a military adventure at a time when their Western markets are shrinking. And therefore, again, trade becomes an instrument for promoting peaceful relations. So on the neighborhood, I would say asymmetrical arrangements because we need them to be well disposed or at least not to be obstacles to our own advancement. And because uh, we're big enough, we can afford to give more. You see, uh, uh, Mr. Gujral is a very dear friend of mine. He did some, do some good things also. Where, that was a good where a good thing needed to be done, the settlement of the Ganga waters with, uh, with Bangladesh, very good. But uh, just being, you know, sentimental about ne Nepal, open border, there are 20, uh, 30 million Nepalese, there are 10 million India. Bangladesh, not an open border, nevertheless, influx continues, and God knows how many millions of Bangladeshis are here. So there are several sides to this. I think we should leave some time, Mr. Panda, the for audience. the audience also. But before that, I want to tell you uh, how much I appreciated the chapter on uh, the underpinning to foreign policy, the foreign service. Glad to hear that coming from I, you. A I lot know, of your colleagues no, have not no, felt the I same think, way. I think, as you say, we have a good foreign service, very small. Particularly, the headquarters strength is very, very meager. Uh, ambassadors are complaining that joint secretaries have no time to receive them for months for consultation and so on and so forth. But uh, we don't need 5,000 Indian Foreign Service officers. I think around 2,000, 2,500 will suffice. Oh, I'd be very happy with half that because right but, now we but, have but barely is, 900. That is going to take 10 years. This lateral entry, I want to, uh, you don't know this, you see, you mm -hmm. were not around here at the time. <laughs> right. We had lateral entry of 120 people in the Indian Foreign Service in 1948, 49, 50. Right. The experience was not very good except with some exceptions. There were fist fights. There were all kinds of quarrels problems, bad behavior. See, foreign service diplomacy needs certain disciplines which come from training. Some lateral entry of uh, people who have the discipline in, it, in their respective services, I think is all right, uh, but in small doses. But right. I, overall, I think the chapter is well written. The points are well taken. 
That's very kind. Unless just, Mr. just Panda, to add, you have something to say. Should we invite some? Uh, we should open it up. Sure. Open up. But while you're identifying a question, just to add one more thought. You had mentioned earlier we don't need to be like the U.S. Fair enough. The U.S. has 20,000 diplomats. But Brazil has 1,200. China has 4,200. The British have 6,000. And we have a foreign service comparable in size to that of tiny Singapore or New Zealand, which are little island states of 4 million people each. I mean, we really can, I think, afford to engage Dr. at least 100% more. At one time, this is, you mentioned in your book, at one time we had 1,400 people in the Indian High Commission in London. You think it made a better High Commission? No, I didn't. I was sent there, I was sent there to cut it down. I hope you did. I did. Good. I brought it down to 400. And I said, even this is too much. No, I think it's... They weren't all Foreign Service officers, I hasten to add. something. The vast number were yeah. not. Yeah. Right. Uh, yes, there's the hand here. Let's see. I hope Sunanda is not here. I've not been too rough on you. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's not here, sir. Mr. Sashidur, the way China is growing larger than its size, do you think it's going to be substituted for USSR as a bipolar world, which will be better, more stable than multipolar or unipolar? No, I don't see China quite there yet. But, you know, it's possible. It, it's not impossible. My own personal view, and we're all looking into the future, so none of us has any particular authority about the future any more than anyone else does. I personally believe we're moving to a world beyond superpowers. I think to think in terms of a Cold War binary world, the U.S. and USSR, is so 20th century, as they say in America. I think in the 21st century, we are more likely to be moving towards a world where nobody is a superpower, that the U.S. Uh, uh, will, for all sorts of reasons, be shrinking its footprint across the globe, in my view. Uh, the Chinese will certainly grow, but will never have the capacity that the, Chinese, the U.S. has enjoyed of being able to intervene decisively half a world away to change a government or to, to, to uh, exercise uh, military muscle. I think that we are going to be having a large number of powers. You can call them great powers, you can call them significant powers, uh, but I don't think we're going to be having superpowers for much longer. I think we are looking at the emergence or the dawning of a world beyond superpowers, which of course would be a perfect world for multi-alignment, because you can then connect to each of them in different ways without fearing that, uh, that you can't connect to both because they're in some sort of uh, world-destroying antagonism. I, I don't think we're heading there. Right. Remember, for example, the U.S. and USSR, there was absolutely no interpenetration. The Americans had no investments in, the, in Russia and vice versa. Today, the U.S. and Chinese economies are so completely intermeshed. You can't imagine an antagonistic relationship like that of the U.S. and the USSR because each is deeply embedded in the economic success of the other. Um, I'm Arvinda Brara, Chairman and Managing Director of Mantec Consultants. I'd just like to uh, point out that uh, the image of India about two years ago was very good. The economy was on the upswing, people looked to India, but unfortunately in the last two years today it's at a low ebb and the reasons are I think certain inconsistencies in the treatment for people from outside India. For example, the tax, you know, back, backdated taxation on Vodafone, etc. That's not the only thing. Also, no reforms, you know, inactivity, and uh, therefore the growth is sliding and all that. So, what do you think, uh, Shashi, could be done to get back to uh, uh, an image which shows that we can act decisively and properly? Well, your question actually points to the impact of domestic policy making on our foreign postures, and you're quite right. I think countries outside are looking at some of the domestic choices we're making as well. I think, in fact, in this particular area, the government is well seized of the problem. And we've seen some statements from the Prime Minister that suggest very clearly that reform is going to be back on the agenda and that some of the more controversial or less liked provisions of the last budget are being reviewed by empowered committees with a new finance minister looking at that. So I think you will find signals being sent to the outside world starting now, if not tomorrow, um, that, that will, will perhaps help change that image. So. Um, I, I worry a little less than I might have worried, say, a month ago, about where we are going. Governor Jha, he is a uh, member, the of, the member of the Foreign Service. Mr. Chairman, the, in Turkey, I think, was as there. a former Foreign Service officer, may I pick up the point about expansion of the Kedda? I, I, you have mentioned about a separate set of exams in your various articles and all. I completely agree, agree with you there about the, about the mode of recruitment to Foreign Service through separate set of exams. 
But I, I tend to agree with Mr. Shgotra that taking all in sundry in the sense of lateral, uh, lateral entry would not exactly impart the sense of professionalism or discipline which you need to carry out the conduct diplomacy, at least at the, and even more so in the present context, global context. On neighbors, I'm afraid I have to agree with Mr. Shkotra. Uh, we serve together in Nepal. <laughs> uh, it's not for that reason only, but for all reasons, other reasons also. Uh, I, we have to be more generous to the neighbors, no doubt. But in the process of being generous, we must also see before being, being extreme generous as to what is the sense of reciprocity they extend to us. We don't want to grab their resources, but we want to see that they, 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 there's certain goodwill in their dealings with us at all levels. And then, of course, we can open our heart out to them and give them much more than they, than they want. So we well, have that's the, an the capacity. On Pakistan, it is often said that, you know, we must strengthen the civil society there. And they are, they are democratic and liberal in nature and so on. I completely agree with you there. But how do we do it? By handing over everything they want. Uh, basically, it's their problem. They have to shed blood to get rid of the military and come and have a civilian government. It's not something you can impose upon them. Thank uh, you. And, and one, one final point was, uh, was about these contradictory stances that we have taken today, apparently contradictory stances in our various groupings that we have. Uh, there's only one grouping I'm worried about. I agree with you on the other, all the other groupings, Mr. Tharoor. The SCO. Now, we have China there, and very soon we may have Pakistan there also as well, member. Others are very friendly, Russia, Central Europe, etc. But how do we tackle this? Because there will be occasions on which we'll have to keep on choosing uh, or, or uh, going against China there that the Russians in their present phase of extreme friendship with China may not like that particular posture. So this is something which I think has to be worked out in greater detail. Lastly, on, on West Asia, where I also served in uh, five years in Kuwait and two years in Turkey, in, in adjacent areas, Syria is really a question, I mean, I, I'm not so sure that the fighting going on there now is, is, is for the sake of, of, of restoring human rights there. It is really an extension of the Sunni-Shia conflict, which has suddenly come to fore in a big way, is actively supported by Turkey, hmm. unfortunately. And for us, and we must emphasize this on the Americans and others, just as they look at the world from their point of view, from situated as we are, this part of the world, a secular state in that area is a very vital consideration for us. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Jha. I think that's an observation for all those. Yes, I would have no particular differences with most of them. On the very first point about the expansion of the card of the Foreign Service, just to clarify two things. The first is, you know, you all come from that vintage when you were the elite. We had to be in the top ten of the civil service exams to even get into the Foreign Service. Uh, that's no longer the case, frankly. And so my argument that today our, our one-size-fits-all civil service examination is not looking at the right kinds of qualities, I think is sustainable. I, in other words, we are recruiting bureaucrats, not diplomats, and, and we are not looking through the, the examination doesn't test the internationalist mindedness of these young Indians, uh, their aptitudes for languages, their ability to talk to foreigners, their ability to engage. I've heard stories of, of, of recruits coming in who actually needed remedial English before they could even function in the ministry. And, and that is a very far cry from where the Foreign Service you all knew. Uh, I believe that a separate examination, which is not the same examination taken by cops and customs officials, but is, is one that looks specifically for these qualities and that will emphasize, for example, much more on an oral interview, uh, which tests these qualities, will actually give us a better foreign service and will, for example, be viable for, for example, the NRIs growing up around the world who actually have Indian passports and Indian allegiances but could never pass a UPSC examination because they haven't studied the kinds of things you need to pass those examinations. But sitting in, in the Gulf or in Western Europe or whatever, they've learned foreign languages, have grown up with foreigners, they know how to re relate with people. We need people like that representing us in the world. And my only argument for lateral entry is that we have gaps today, usually gaps requiring specialized knowledge or specialized skills, including linguistic skills, which cannot be filled merely by expanded recruitment and training, because that means you'll have to wait 10 years to get these remedial steps taken to, fill, to, to, to fulfill gaps that, um, that exist today. So that's why I feel, as a temporary measure, you can get people, including if necessary from the private sector, coming in on, say, five-year contracts, doing what you need them to do in particular areas, Spanish speakers, public relations experts in our public diplomacy division, climate change experts in our negotiations there, whatever, 
And then after, after a while, you will have trained people and brought them up into the system uh, in due course. But we need, it seems to me, to attend to our problems yeah. today. Well, so. we, have to, we have to conclude. Young lady, yes, last question. I'm sorry, Thank I'm told you. to um, conclude evening, the uh, Mr. Proceeding. Theroux, and congratulations on another magnum opus. Thank um, you. My question quickly was a little bit picking up on your uh, asymmetric approach to peace with Pakistan. Uh, and I was wondering, um, we all know to some extent that the moment of truth came for Pakistan a while ago. Uh, but I was curious to know whether you think that the people of Pakistan can claim their country back. What will that take in your view? Um, and the second was a little larger question on uh, the nature of violence in the 21st century. Um, even Gandhi conceded that on the continuum of time, we have become less violent as a world. But um, do, does India have something unique still to offer in terms of its spiritual and peace building tradition to the world, or is that a big misnomer? Hmm. All right. Well, on, on the first one, yes, I think it's already happening to some degree, beginning. We're seeing the beginnings of Pakistan civil society reasserting itself and trying to take itself back. And from some of the unlikely quarters, I, I quote in the book a, uh, a figure who is usually described in Western agency reports by the word fundamentalist, a man called Maulana Fazlur Rahman, who has said that the urgency of reclaiming Kashmir has to take a backseat to the urgency of saving Pakistan. This kind of thing is now coming up within the Pakistani political space, a peaceful democratic Pakistan coexisting with India, or who see their interests more narrowly, as in preserving their privileges by fomenting hostility with India. The jury is still out on that. We'll have to see how that evolves. On whether we have a spiritual contribution to make the world, I've tended to be very hesitant to make such, such claims, um, largely because um, I don't think it sits very well in the years of others. You know, if they want to imbibe any spiritual wisdom from us, they'll come and ask us for it. But for us to start spouting everything from Ashoka to the Buddha, as we did a lot of at one time, uh, and, 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 and suggest that we somehow uh, might have been morally superior to those listening to us, I think was ill-advised then and would be really inappropriate today. I'm much more uh, keen on, 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 on us taking a pragmatic approach. I think one of the best arguments for nonviolence is that it's always more effective than violence. Violence actually has, very poor, has a very poor record in the history of the world in accomplishing the ends for which it is deployed. Uh, and therefore, uh, uh, sort of making a pragmatic case for coexistence, for tolerance, for, for, for nonviolence and so on might actually be more effective than preaching, which I'm not sure we're very good at. And I must say that other countries that have tried it on other subjects have not exactly won many friends or influenced many countries either. Thank you. Mr. Panda, you. you have a last one sentence. <laughs> one concluding sentence. No, I think this is a wonderful contribution that takes forward his, Shashi's body of work uh, in a very, very impressive manner. And I think the last thing I'd say is look forward to the next one. Uh, Dr. Tharoor. It only remains for me to thank you. I think you have written a book which should be a must read for every foreign service officer and everyone else in India who is interested in India's security, foreign policy, and so on and so forth. Thank you very much. Thank you. Delhi in time. How so are nice you? So nice again. I'm so grateful for that.